The gateway to perception comes in a thousand shapes. And we adorn it in a thousand ways. But its real beauty is buried deep in the skull. It's the only sense organ that does two totally different jobs. It picks up sound, and it keeps us on a sound footing. Without this little piece of architecture, our whole framework could tumble down. Tune into the human ear, next on Body Atlas. Inside the ears is a delicate mechanism which gives Zeta the spring in her step. For her career as an international gymnast, her ears are Zeta's most essential organs. They're the gateway for the music to reach her brain where rhythm and melody are translated into a graceful and inspirational flow of movement. Even more important, Zeta's ears contain the organs that allow her to balance. They keep track of her body's every move, whether she's on the ground or flying through the air. Without the intricate mechanisms of the ear, we'd never be treated to a display like this. Even if we can't all perform as well as Zeta, our ears keep us constantly in touch with what's going on. They tune into the sounds of speech, the uniquely human way of communicating. Hidden in a cavity within the solid bones of the skull, evolution has manufactured the most sensitive of receivers. Only some parts are used for hearing. The round eardrum, a set of bones, and the snail-shaped cochlea. Our ears can distinguish millions of different sounds, more than any other animal. We can recognize hundreds of friends and acquaintances by very small differences between their voices. We can pick out what they're saying amid a multitude of distractions, and even pinpoint their position by sound alone. Our inbuilt direction finding depends mainly on having two ears. A voice from Zeta's left side reaches this ear before her right ear, revealing her coach's exact position, even if the delay is only a few millionths of a second. Zeta. Ears aren't mirror images. They differ slightly, so they each react differently to the same sound. The ear's convolutions are as individual as a fingerprint. They help to refine our direction-finding sense. As sounds bombard the ear from different angles, these ridges and folds amplify some frequencies and diminish others. They produce subtle changes in sound which we detect without thinking about them. 
the fleshy outer ear channels the sound waves into the head, down the inch-long ear canal. Hairs and wax keep out dirt and curious insects. At the far end, the sound waves pound on the only barrier between the outside world and the ear's internal mechanism, the eardrum. This membrane is stretched tightly across the ear canal. The eardrum vibrates with each sound, a simple movement that begins the whole process of hearing. From the eardrum, the sound must follow a complex route through the ear before it's finally analyzed by the coiled structure of the cochlea. This will be a journey through some of the body's smallest structures. From the eardrum, the sound travels through this air-filled cavity, the middle ear. It's only one-third of an inch wide. The vibrations are passed on by three tiny bones. The hammer, attached directly to the inside of the eardrum, comes first. The second bone is named after its supposed resemblance to an anvil. The third is the smallest bone in the body, no larger than a grain of rice. It's fittingly called the stirrup. These bones act as tiny levers, magnifying the pressure of the sound waves over 20 times. But this mechanism also forms a bodyguard for the delicate structures further in. If the eardrum is assailed by a dangerously loud sound, the body's two smallest muscles tighten and restrain the wildly vibrating bones. These are the only bones that don't grow during childhood. An adult has ear bones the same size as a newborn baby. This exquisitely tuned mechanism can withstand a surprising amount of rough and tumble. The middle ear can have problems when the outside pressure suddenly alters, stretching the eardrum and throwing the bony levers out of balance. The altitude changes during an airplane flight can be a recipe for earache. As the sensitive membranes are distorted, they send pain signals to the brain. The pain eases as air flows through a thin tube running up from the throat. It matches the pressure here to the air outside. The journey of the sound waves in the middle ear ends with the vibrations of the stirrup bone pressing on a thin membrane called the oval window. Beyond lie the fluid-filled cavities of the inner ear. Like the underwater song of a whale, the sound now resonates through salty fluid filling the hollow shell of the cochlea. The spiraling structure is buried in the thickest part of the skull, deep within its bony fortifications. We can only appreciate its internal architecture by chipping away this bone. The pea-sized cochlea contains a mechanism of amazing complexity. Running all the way up the spiral is our body's built-in microphone, the organ of Corti. It transforms sound vibrations into electrical signals that can travel the nervous system, the communications network that links all parts of the body. No radio engineer has designed a microphone so small or so elegant. Four rows of V-shaped bristles stand to attention. They crown 15,000 hair-shaped cells. As the hair cells vibrate, their bristles stamp a matching imprint on the membrane above. 
Here, sound vibrations have traveled as far as they can. Like organ pipes working in reverse, the bristles turn sound into a musical score, electrical signals coded for loudness and pitch. Switched on by music, the bristly upper end of each individual hair cell dances up and down, hundreds of times faster than any other cell can move. This tiny hair is all that stands between us and silence. And a silent world would be an empty world indeed. The ear is a triumph of bionics. It's a seamless union of acoustics, mechanics, hydraulics, electronics, and miniaturization. But the listening part of our ear is nothing without its central computer, the brain. Its convoluted folds are busy decoding messages gathered up by nerves throughout the body, and then thinking about them. This particular region is devoted to sound. Lying right next to the ears, its sole function is to interpret the messages from the cochlea. This pure tone activates a single spot in the brain, lighting up on the electronic scan. Sounds of different pitch target other spots. A symphony is spread all over the hearing region, and it's a small miracle that we can perceive it as a whole. As we get older, we gradually lose the higher frequencies. The hairs in the cochlea begin to die from the moment we're born. The busy hairs that process high notes wear out first, so older people can't hear very high-pitched sounds, like the squeak of a bat, which younger people can easily detect. From our very earliest years, humans don't just listen. We actively make sounds to communicate with others. To master a language like English, we must learn to pronounce 40 different sounds. Even the youngest baby can recognize his mother by her voice. He heard his first sounds three months before he was even born, as his mother's voice resonated through the womb. Now his ears will be the key to language. Only by listening can a baby learn to speak. The first year is a frustrating stage of life. A toddler can understand many words, but it will be several months before he can say them. The hearing part of the brain develops earlier than the regions that control speech, and the key organ for making intelligent sounds, the voice box, doesn't work properly until a child's first birthday. From an infant's babbling, single words begin to crystallize. On average, girls start to speak earlier than boys, though no one knows why. Surrounded by the sounds of language, a child's repertoire grows rapidly. By the age of two, some precocious children can speak 2,000 different words. That's a big enough vocabulary for everyday life in an English-speaking country. From this time on, speaking as well as listening becomes a vital part of human existence. We are the only creatures that can communicate abstract ideas from one individual to another. Our neighbor's words of wisdom are carried to our ears on puffs of thin air, pushed out from the lungs. Whether it's a command or an endearment, every sentence we speak is merely a stream of air, orchestrated by an ensemble of bodily organs, beginning deep down in the throat with the voice box. 
Its muscles relax when we breathe. Air can flow easily to and from the lungs through a wedge-shaped gateway an inch across. Its V-shaped lining of pale tissue are the two vocal cords. When we speak, the vocal cords snap shut, pulled by muscles which can also change the shape of the voice box. Air, trapped behind the vocal cords, escapes in short puffs, vibrating them like the reed of a clarinet. Special stroboscopic lighting reveals the vocal cords vibrating as we speak. The speed of these vibrations affects the pitch of our voice. A man's vocal cords vibrate about 120 times every second, and a woman's twice as fast. As we grow older, the vocal cords lengthen. Children have short, flexible vocal cords, vibrating fast. They produce a high-pitched voice. A baby is born with vocal cords a quarter of an inch long. As the cords lengthen, the pitch of the voice gradually falls. By the age of 10, they are half an inch long. The biggest change comes at puberty, as hormones surge through the bodies of both boys and girls. The male sex hormone, testosterone, enlarges a boy's voice box much more dramatically than a girl's. By the age of 20, a man has vocal cords one inch long, while a woman's are only two-thirds that length. It's not just pitch that makes a friend's voice instantly recognizable. The sound resonates through empty cavities behind the face, giving it a unique timber. The tongue and lips put a final shape to the words. The pelican, the pelican, his beak can hold more than his belly. None of us could say the without moving the tongue, nor pelican without bringing the lips together. Speech and communication give our ears a special role in human life. Yet hearing is not the ear's most important job. We can live without sound, but the ear's other role is crucial for our survival. It provides our sense of balance. Without balance organs in her ears, Zita couldn't even get out of bed in the morning, let alone begin her routine. A sense of balance evolved in our earliest ancestors. Although a fish may not aspire to gymnastics, it still needs to know which way is up in its watery world. The fish's ear has no cochlea, but it contains all the structures it needs to detect motion and gravity. From our aquatic forefathers, these balance organs have passed down to the whole animal kingdom today. We've inherited exactly the same arrangement of fluid-filled tubes buried deep in the skull. Our balancing mechanism lies in the same cavity as the organs that hear, but they work in splendid isolation. The three loops in this exotic sculpture are fluid-filled tubes that tell the brain how the head is moving, backwards or forwards, up or down, or from one side to the other. As Zeta's head spins around, the fluid in these semicircular canals rushes in the opposite direction.
Neatly set at right angles, the three loops can accurately track Zeta's head as it twists or spins in any direction. The fluid rushes past a microscopic meter that measures its flow. Hidden under the bulge is a carpet of tiny hairs which waft with the current. They stimulate nerve cells which send signals to the brain. These hairs may lose track of the moving fluid. If you spin around and suddenly stop, they send messages that your head is still on the move and the confused brain feels dizzy. To keep her balance, Zeta also needs to know which way is up. So the versatile ear provides a second balance organ, which responds to gravity. It lies in the center of the inner ear, next to the spiraling cochlea. This cavity is one of a pair. It's filled with fluid and encloses hundreds of tiny crystals of chalk, each less than a thousandth of an inch across. Thick mucus binds the crystals into a slippery mat. As you tilt your head, the mat slides sideways, trying to move to the lowest point inside the cavity. It ruffles up a carpet of sensitive hairs underneath. The changing load reveals which way gravity is pulling. The whole set of balance organs in both ears sends electrical messages along nerves to the back of the brain. This is one of the most primitive parts of the brain, found in animals as simple as frogs and alligators. These folds of tissue are in charge of keeping us upright and coordinating every move. This busy region works day and night, comparing the messages from the balance organs. It checks them out against what we are seeing and touching and the tension in our muscles. The result of its deliberations is forwarded through a spaghetti of nerves onwards to the front of the brain, where we consciously feel how we're moving. Zeta's brain then sends messages to her muscles to coordinate and fine-tune her movements, though it's not always that easy. The inner ear tells both Zeta and the fish which way is up? The ear is the gateway that allows sounds deep into our brains, carrying the messages in speech, in natural sounds, and deep subconscious messages like the comfort of a mother's heartbeat. With its ungainly outer flap and its hidden sensitive soul, the ear is the Cinderella of the sense organs. Compared to other senses, hearing and balance may seem crude. They rely on bony levers and liquid sloshing round tubes. Yet the ear is acutely sensitive. When we hear the faintest sounds, the hairs in the cochlea are moving less than the diameter of an atom. And our superb sense of balance speaks for itself.